Praise be Jesus Christ and welcome to Catholic Forum. I'm Alan Dunst, your guest host for today's conversation, and we thank you for being with us today. And we hope that our conversation here in West Michigan finds you wherever you may be and draws you a little closer to Jesus Christ as one holy Catholic and apostolic church. On today's show, we are going to have a, a, a frequent guest that we love having with us, Dr. Dennis Marshall. So I want to thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I love having you on the show because um, when we, we get to talk about philosophy, and, and I, I truly believe that um, philosophical thought, we, no, no one thinks of themselves as a philosopher, yet we all have a philosophy. We have this underlying foundational pattern of thought that we rest so many of our actions and daily choices on mm -hmm. and that we really don't um, uh, think about them. And so that's why you, know, you really make, help us to kind of focus on these little niches and, and uh, hopefully we come to know ourselves better in the process. So really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Happy to do it. So um, we've had you uh, on the show before talking about truth uh, and the nature of truth, and we talked a little bit about uh, the Enlightenment and how that uh, kind of uh, got a number of thinkers uh, kind of focusing on a certain method of uh, evaluating truth and defining truth, uh, and some might say to the impoverishment of truth. Um, and what we want to kind of talk about today is something that's uh, also a little less easy to define, and that is morality and the good and, and um, how that how we de determine it and how it affects our, our choices as we use that. Um, so let's uh, start off with uh, the question, okay? We talked about there being truth and, and things that are true and things that are, are and are not. Um, but um, why do we, what makes us think that there's a moral universe, a, a, real, a, a, a moral content to the realities that we have, the truth to creation? I think that, that there are two reasons for that. The first one is is our own essential nature as human beings. As, as we talked last time, uh, what distinguishes us from all other living creatures here is that we possess a rational soul and that uh, has two powers, the intellect and the will. And the intellect is perfected in the knowledge of the truth as we talked about and the will is perfected in the, in the good. And, and so consequently, we human beings by nature are oriented to a, a type of participation in the world in which we are evaluating between goods. And some things are apparently good for us, whereas other things are truly good for us. And so we are attracted to that in a particular way. The second way is, is that the way that our universe is, is structured. <clears throat> St. Thomas Aquinas would note that that our entire existence, uh, as created by God, everything that exists has a particular purpose, and that particular purpose is related to its good. So when, when we ask questions, practical questions, which is the moral question, we ask, for example, what is the good of something? What is mm -hmm. the good of eating, or what is the good of speech? And as soon as we ask that question, we are on the hunt for structures intrinsic in the created order that give us some insight into the nature of how we ought to conform our behavior so as to um, optimize the most benefit uh, for that. I mean, to speak in non-moral terms, more evolutionary mm -hmm. terms, perhaps. <laughs> so in, in that particular respect, then, there, there is a structure within the universe that corresponds with our, our mind and in, uh, inquiry into the good that demands of us that we, we act in a certain way that corresponds appropriately to the type of being that we are. Which, and so, for example, let's say, what is the good of sex? Right? This is 1960s, I've been asking that question. They still haven't <laughs> answered it. And um, you know, some, some people would say, 
Well, the good of sex is, uh, is pleasure. And so they would look at, for example, how sex is engaged in on the animal level. And, and let's say for rabbits, we'll see rabbits do that. Mm -hmm. And since we're natural creatures ourselves, then it must be okay for us to act in the same way that rabbits do. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that reduces our humanity to the level of animality. And what we understand the human being to be is distinguished from rabbits and pigs and everything mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. is the, this rational dimension of soul. So with, in that regard then, we have to act in accordance to what is highest and best within us, what perfects mm -hmm. us. And what perfects us is not our sensual nature, which we have because we're partly animal, and not our um, uh, you know, normal nutritive systems that deal with uh, nutrition and conservation of life, but rather this intellectual dimension of our life that orients us to the world, to discover the truth of it, and to um, embrace the good that we find in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that you were saying there, uh, I want to kind of touch on a little bit in the sense that you were talking about um, that everything is created with a purpose. And it's um, you know interesting that you know people don't necessarily think about anything that they've run across, any physical thing. Um, that has been made, typically you can think of the reason it was made. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got paper so I can write on something and carry it around, and I've got a book so I can read, and I make a picture because I like to have, you know, colors and all this. There's a reason that drives the creation of anything, and so it's interesting that, you know, some people would look at the, the cosmos and say, no reason for that, though, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that there, the, the, there's no reason for purpose or anything like that, because mm -hmm. um, unlike Catholics who see God creating the world for a, a particular goal, namely uh, perfection in himself because he shares his goodness, materialists who would see that the world is a self-generating being and um, in a certain sense evolves by chance as it is over time, cannot discern a purpose within it, mm -hmm. for them it would be a random, uh, uh, random forces mm -hmm. shaping, uh, shaping the world in which we live and even shaping ourselves, something that we couldn't really make sense of because there's no sense to it. Right. And, and mm -hmm. that is, mm -hmm. uh, that's a particular uh, problem. And when we look at the world that way, and then we try to do philosophy in, in that sense as far as trying to discern our meaning and purpose within that greater scheme, then generally you end up with um, uh, types of existentialisms which are nihilistic and despairing because they don't see any reason for being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, reason that, the reasons that they make for being, they construct their own meaning, right. aren't enough to support uh, this fundamental, uh, substantial drive for meaning that is contained within them and has to be anchored in something more substantial outside of them. So if you're just looking at it, the universe from a materialist standpoint, ultimately you're going to run into uh, a nihilism and a despair, mm -hmm. which is sad. Right. Um, so let's talk about other constructs of the good, how people have come to think about it, and, and particularly in the Western uh, thought. How how is the, the the ideas of good uh, kind of evolved? Yeah, um, maybe evolved is not a good term, <laughs> but, maybe, but I'm going to play with that anyway. Okay. But if we go back to Plato, who if 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 people have read Plato's allegory of the cave, there was a man in the bottom of that cave who was who was chained and only looking forward and looking what is on the walls of that cave, which are shadows, and he hears the echoes of the sounds that are coming from behind him. This is his life, this is what he knows. And for, for Plato, that is not a life that is appropriate to human beings who are called to participate in a higher uh, good. Mm -hmm. And so miraculously, he's turned around by some force and he's dragged out of the cave until he is um, outside of the cave and looking at reality in its most pristine form. Okay. And ultimately, his eyes are drawn up to the sun, which is uh, representative of the good. And the good is the source of, source of all being and, and is diffusive of itself. And so this whole allegory is his way of saying that if we live in ignorance, in the shadows of ignorance, then we are not living in a manner that is worthy of our intelligence. And so it's only when we are able to see being itself, in this sense the sun, which is representative of the good, that we find the true meaning and purpose of our lives. Mm 
And this is, this is an interesting and fascinating uh, thing because then the man of virtue, the man of wisdom, is not the man who simply opines down in the darkness, but is rather in, in the light. Now this sounds familiar, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Because uh, it's only in the light of Christ that we see light itself. So this good, which Plato sees and is uh, able to only name as the good, and recognizes it as the source of everything, is uh, then through revelation made sharper uh, for us because we not only um, see that God is the good, but he is the creative good, he's the source of good, and he has a name, and he's a person, and he's intelligent. And because he is the source of all good, then everything that he makes, he imprints his goodness on everything that he makes. So that everything then is um, uh, suffused with the divine goodness. And precisely because of that, we're attracted to it. And we can be attracted to inquiring into the world and ultimately then turn and um, find our way to God. So you see, St. Augustine would say something like this. He says, um, in the um, consideration of creatures, one should not exercise a vain and perishing curiosity, but ascend to what is highest. So if I turn my attention simply to the good of the world, like a donut, which is my favorite example, <laughs> it should say something. Uh, if, I turn, if I turn my attention to that good, and then I reduce it to the highest good, then I am, not, I am making an idol of that so that it is going to distort my judgment and distort my understanding of the truth. But if I see that good and recognize it within the great scheme of all other goods, that they derive from a higher good, then I can come to an understanding that these goods that I know here in this world are implicitly speaking to me of a higher good, which is God. Now, this mm -hmm. is an interesting concept within the context of Catholic education, for example, because the truth and goodness that God, within which God makes the world is um, represented in the way that we study all these various aspects of reality. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's in the laboratory looking at a slide of bacteria under a microscope, they may not be explicitly looking at God, but implicitly, because they're dealing with one of God's handiworks, they're oriented to his goodness. Now over the course of time, as we've become less and less Christian in our disposition in society, other definitions of good have been uh, promoted as replacements really for um, the, cr the classical Christian understanding that I just articulated. Mm -hmm. So you have John Stuart Mill, for example, in his utilitarianism in which uh, good is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people and that's, that's how you, you would calculate that. So, but that's, that's kind of problematic because if I can uh, come up with a situation in which your death is going to make a hundred other people happy, then since they're going to have a greater happiness to, that will outweigh whatever sorrow you may experience in, in your agony, then um, that would give a kind of a justification to take you mm -hmm. out of existence. And um, that sounds rather simplistic, but we use that kind of calculus, for example, even though we may not know it, when, uh, for example, we justify abortion, or mm -hmm. we justify euthanasia, or some other such thing. So those kinds of understandings of the good, <clears throat> utilitarian calculus like John Stuart Mill, are predicated upon a loss of the transcendent divine, mm -hmm. and in which we are pretty much confronted with problems of the world that we've got to solve here mm -hmm. without any appeal to a transcendent good. And then there's hedonism, for example, which runs into similar problems as the, uh, as the utilitarian calculus of, say, Mill. And, and hedonism is, is a matter of calculating which pleasure is best for myself. And so if I'm confronted with the, the pleasure of eating a donut and then the pleasure of riding a roller coaster or the pleasure of engaging in um, sexual intercourse or something like that, then I have to go through some kind of evaluative process to be able to discriminate which is a higher pleasure, which mm -hmm. is a more dignified pleasure, and so on. And well, on what basis do I do, do that? On what basis do I measure that? Right. So it's good it becomes just a, an arbitrary in, yardstick that one carries with them. Indeed and, it does, uh, right? It, it becomes, um, uh, in language that I've used before and the tradition uses, it becomes a matter of what we desire. And so by definition then, because we desire something, that automatically makes it good. But in the classical Christian tradition, our desire is not the defining principle of the good, 
God is the defining principle of the good. So the good then is, um, is defined within Christianity as what is desirable. Now this, I find this to be particularly interesting because when God creates the world and pronounces it to be good, by that very fact, everything that he creates becomes desirable for us. Mm. We, we're drawn out of uh -huh. ourselves to, uh, because we perceive it as a good. And at the same time, uh, we have to, we're confronted with the challenge of discerning between apparent goods, those things that are apparently good for us, and those things that are really good for us. Mm -hmm. And that, now we're confronted with the problem of moral analysis. So but by what standard then do we, do we gauge? Well, we don't gauge by what we desire. We gauge by what God has um, designed into the, into the universe. We help discern our, for ourselves the good through the process of natural law reasoning, mm -hmm. for example. And we also come to an understanding that in our quest for the good, we don't just want temporary satisfactions. We want permanent Mm -hmm. Satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, when we live in a world that is transient, like we do, then none of the goods that we participate in are ultimately satisfying. They're always pointing us to the highest good, which is God. Right. And so our perfection as human beings, then, is found in the ultimate desirable. What is ultimately desirable is what will ultimately satisfy us. And we are only satisfied by God because our hearts, as Augustine says, are restless mm -hmm. until they rest in Him. Right. So it's like, it's like God creates a universe that conspires to draw attention to him. And that's even before he steps into it through revelation and, um, and makes that a much more pointed appeal to, to love. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to kind of touch on um, the, the title of our show, obviously, is uh, from Scripture. Uh, refers to, you know, Jesus saying to the, uh, the wealthy young man, why do you mm -hmm. call me good? And, mm -hmm. and essentially pointing to God right. as that. Uh, ultimate source of good. Um, one um, objection that you know atheists might have when they consider God as the, the source of good and all that is that then they look at you know the Old Testament and say, well, this guy doesn't seem like a real good God because he's you know wiping out you know the, you know, the people who are in right, the, the promised land, and you know, Jebusites, and, 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 yeah. Uh, so um, so how do, how do we address that kind of objection? Well. One of the ways I do it, and, this, and David Hume uh, draws attention to this, he denies God's existence because of the uh, experience of evil and even experience of evil and suffering on the, that are perpetrated by, by Christians. But he's got this idea of God where he says that um, if, if there is a God, then um, this God is good. And it's the, um, it's the obligation of a good God to prevent evil wherever he, he might prevent it you see. Mm. And because God doesn't prevent evil, obviously we experience evil in the mm -hmm. world, then therefore there is no God. But the objection to that kind of um, simplistic, I, I think it's a simplistic view, I don't, I don't find it to be particularly challenging, is just for me to think about my parents whom I consider to be good. Well, they didn't prohibit me from doing everything that would get me into trouble right. if, or suffer. So riding a bike, for example, were, were my parents evil when they put me on the bike and allowed mm -hmm. me then to have the opportunity to fall off and skin my knee? No, we wouldn't say mm -hmm. that. Right. So if, just from that kind of experience, we could say that the experience of suffering might even in fact be beneficial to us. And so God allows suffering in that sense to be beneficial. Well, that's, that's the easy one. But what about <laughs> God sending the Israelites into uh, Jericho, you know, and mm -hmm. circling around the city and causing it to collapse in on itself? And then how do you deal with that? And God uh, demanding a holy war of the Jews, for example. Well, the way that um, God is related to his people is that they are his representatives on earth, right? That they have, um, they have a vocation as a people to testify that Yahweh is God and there is no other. And because God is the author of life, and he's also the author of our freedom, and um, there may come a point in our existence when we become so reprehensible in our abuse of that freedom that justice needs to be done. And so with respect to the Israelites entering into uh, Jericho or the Promised Land or <clears throat> engaging in holy war against people, 
the Israelites, and I myself would see that, is that in this particular instance, God has brought a judgment against those nations, and the Israelites then become a cooperator with God, right, in, um, in executing in that judgment. And so it's not, it, it's the Israelites judge, uh, it's the Israelites uh, being used, if you will, as a tool by God to bring justice and restore right order. Now, the question is, is does God have the right to do that? Does God have the right to open up the proverbial can of you know what and, <laughs> um, and put it on? Well, yeah, because our lives are not ours to do with as we wish. We're created by God in order to live in communion with him. And our life is his. And so there's no such thing as God murdering me. If he takes me out of existence at this moment, it's not as if God is murdering me because he's just taking back a life that is rightfully his. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, if, and, if I, and if my life is taken at a point where I'm in um, unjust rebellion against God, then he justly takes it back. Mm -hmm. And in that particular respect, I can't see how the exercise of justice would be an evil. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so in, as we're looking at um, contemporary society and, and then Jesus you know, kind of pointing to God, um, how does that change us? How, does, how do we um, exercise our choices with that in mind and when we kind of are looking at that, that higher good and uh, the, not necessarily the imminent, you know, right. quote, good, but the, the, the highest good, as you were right. talking about. Well, the Catholic Church teaches that we have here no lasting city. And I think that's important to remember, especially since we live in a, a day and age in which we think that through political activism we can create a paradise on earth. And this is just something that is not within uh, the realm of human endeavor. Because of our, our sinfulness, our, um, uh, our, our being tainted by original sin, then everything that we do is always in some sense going to be less than good, right? Less mm -hmm. than fully good. And <clears throat> so then, that means that because we have here no lasting city, there, there's nothing here that is going to be able, to, that we're going to be able to fix ourselves upon and achieve any full satisfaction. So we're always going to be restless. Well, in the face of that restlessness, we can do a couple of things. We can just continue to try to acquire more goods and more stuff in order to satisfy this uh, infinite desire for God, or we can listen to the wisdom of Revelation in the church who says that, you know, God gives us these desires and he gives us the goods of the world so that we might live in appropriate relationship with him. And so as I tell my students in theology, the goal of theology is to know, which is really the goal of the spiritual life, is to know God above all things and everything in relationship, with God, uh, relationship to God. So that if I'm properly oriented in heart and mind to God, and I see uh, his plan, his providential plan for creation, including my life, which includes the world in which I live, then I'm going to be able to see everything in its proper place. And I'm going to be able to be um, wise enough to act in a manner that is appropriate to those goods without making them my gods mm -hmm. and without um, abusing them that will place either my neighbor or myself in danger of hellfire. Now, so let me give an example of that because we're coming up on the Christmas season soon, Scrooge, mm -hmm. right? He loves money, and he loves that above all things. And if you, if you see the way that he's represented in especially cartoons and movies, he's always turned in on himself. He's twisted, he's old, he's dried up, he's not creative. He is actually a pathetic figure because he worships something that is not worthy of his dignity. Now what happens when we do that, when we take these proximate goods and we make them the highest good, we we twist the meaning, we distort the meaning of that good, and we also distort the meaning of ourselves. Hence, mm -hmm. Scrooge is twisting. Right. When he has his conversion, he straightens up, he's looking at things, he's, he's profuse in, in the giving of his gifts. Uh, he's diffusing the good that he's um, recognized that is um, greater than simply his stinginess. And you know what he does in that? He imitates God. He becomes mm -hmm. like God in there. Yeah, and I wanted to touch on that because um, you've mentioned it a couple of times, and um, before we started, we kind of were talking along these lines, and I thought it was very interesting in terms of the good being diffusive. Right. Talk, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, the the idea, as far as I know, I first ran across it in Plato, and he uh, 
he said that the good is diffusive of the self that is it, it shares and if you go back to Plato and the sun uh, from the allegory of the cave the good radiates off of, of it you know goodness just radiates out of it but in Plato's particular conception the farther the rays of the goodness got away from its source the less good they became until they became material and mm. and the material world was was considered more like a prison of the spirit than a, a good creation like we Christians see it but this idea of the good being diffusive of itself is found in the doctrine of creation uh, Saint Augustine says that that we exist because God is good that God shares the bountiful goodness that he is so that we can participate and share in that but the thing is that the things that God uh, creates because he himself is good, are they themselves good? And then, and so all of creation and all of things that participate in that creation uh, participate in goodness. And so when we think of the good being diffusive of itself, God bestowing his gift of uh, being on everybody through creation, well then we think about our parents, uh, uh, the goodness of their love becomes diffused through the gift of life of their children, the mm -hmm. gifts they bestow upon them as, they, uh, as they're raised and so on and so forth. We, we run into this principle every time, it's like a metaphysical mm -hmm. principle of the universe. Right, right. Unless you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we only have a few minutes, but I want to touch on one other thing um, because it's so. Uh, I think it's an interesting element of do uh, Catholic doctrine, and that is in the sense of many people would sometimes say the ends justify the means, and mm -hmm. so if you have a good end, you know the means are a little. You can get a little shaky, but the Catholic Church tends to, you know, dismiss that and uh, kind of should say that. You can't be doing good by doing evil. Right. No, we, no, we, can, we cannot do that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the means have to be proportionate to the end. This is what, what the Catholic Church would, would say. So if, if, if I have the, a good, the good that I'm driving for is the end for which I'm moving, then for me to achieve that, I would have to um, uh, utilize appropriate means to arrive at that, let me let me give an example. Since I'm a since I'm a teacher, if I if I want to get a degree or pass a class, then um, and I want to get an A, those are all noble, worthy goals. But to do so by means of cheating, in order for me to arrive at that particular goal, is not a is not a means that is appropriate to the end. Because what happens is that I end up lying uh, about my talents, about my work, and so on and so forth, which is uh, contrary to uh, the truth which God speaks through his word causing everything mm -hmm. to exist as it does so we have to use appropriate means to achieve good uh, the, the appropriate good whenever I use illicit means to achieve a good end then essentially what I'm doing is um, uh, doing evil in order to achieve some good and I, and I cannot do that intentionally but there, but there are circumstances like the principle of double effect. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, that sometimes the good that we intend has um, uh, tragic consequences. Mm -hmm. so, so for example, let's say that a uh, woman is pregnant, she has ovarian cancer. If she doesn't treat the, treat the cancer, then the baby dies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, if she, if she um, or, or she dies, right? If, if she doesn't treat the cancer, she dies, in the, and, and, but the baby will die as a result. If she doesn't treat the cancer, then the baby might live, but she's going to die. Well, how do you resolve that? Well, you don't intentionally abort the fetus in order mm -hmm. to cure the woman. You, cure yeah. the, you intend to cure, see, yeah, yeah. the cancer. And the unfortunate consequence of the evil right. would be the loss of the child's life. And the, these are these are things that we face every day. But if I intended directly the death of that child, for example, then I would be choosing the, the evil means. Right. Well, I would love to talk more about this. Unfortunately, we're out of time. And we really appreciate you being with us and, and, and exploring this uh, topic with us. It's uh, very good. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> and we want to thank you for being with us as well. And we hope that uh, as you look around you, you see the good and the, the highest good. And we ask God to bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.